Different Strokes, Autumn 2022 Newsletter, Audio Version, read by Lauren Hartney. A very warm welcome to our 2022 Autumn Newsletter. Since our last newsletter, we have been greatly saddened by the death of Queen Elizabeth II. With this sad event following difficulties caused by the COVID pandemic, the war in Ukraine, large price rises and a real cost of living crisis, it feels that we are living in very turbulent times. For many stroke survivors, especially those that rely on benefits or are in financial hardship, this is an extremely worrying time. At different strokes, we aim to support stroke survivors and hopefully in some small way, the support that we provide and more importantly, the support provided by our community of stroke survivors can help. We have some fantastic features in this edition of the newsletter. We talk with Amy Callahan, MP, whose story is a reminder that no matter what job you do or what age you are, you can be affected by stroke. We also revisit PFO closures, which we featured previously. We have an article on post-stroke spasticity and look at vision problems after stroke. My thanks to everyone who has contributed to these articles. Since our last newsletter, we have taken on two new staff members, Liz and Rahal, who both talk a little about their roles here, designed to raise greater awareness of younger stroke and to ensure that we are supporting more people. My thanks as always to our staff, volunteers, trustees, funders, supporters and beneficiaries for all that you do. From Austin Willett, CEO of Different Strokes. Introducing Liz Thomas. In May this year, we recruited Liz Thomas to our newly created role of Regional Coordinator for the Hampshire area. Liz is working to raise awareness of Younger Stroke and the support that we provide in the local area. This includes building strong links with the Wessex ISDN or Integrated Stroke Delivery Network. She joins us on an initial 12 month contract thanks to funding from Percy's Pals who provided us with a sizeable donation back in 2020. We asked Liz for her thoughts about her first few months in her new role. How have you found working for different strokes so far? Liz says, I have really enjoyed it so far. It has been interesting becoming involved in the ISDNs. I have enjoyed meeting a number of stroke survivors and engaging with local organisations and healthcare professionals to spread the word about the charity so that we can support more stroke survivors and their carers and families. We asked Liz, in what ways are you engaging with your local integrated stroke delivery network? Liz said, I've been attending the local ISDN meetings via Zoom. The ISDN group is very interested in what stroke survivors and their carers think about stroke services. They are passionate that what they think is taken into account when considering how stroke services are delivered moving forward. We asked Liz to tell us about the links that she has created locally. She says, I have started to develop links with charities, community groups, universities and healthcare staff to increase awareness of different strokes as a charity. We asked Liz, what plans do you have for the next six to 12 months? She says, throughout the next six to 12 months, further work will be undertaken to raise awareness of different strokes by developing new links. Alongside this, I will continue to support carers and ensure that the views of both carers and stroke survivors are considered in the local ISDN. Liz's experience of the stroke world goes significantly beyond that of working for different strokes. Previously, she was a probation officer, but her life changed overnight in 2018 when her husband, Ryan, 
had a very severe stroke. The last four years have seen Liz and Ryan and their family navigate many challenges. And it was during this time that Liz became aware of different strokes via her local group in Southampton. At Different Strokes, we have always sought to involve stroke survivors and their families in the design of our services and the implementation of them too. We are delighted to now have a staff member who can bring a carer's perspective to our work. Support for carers is an area that we would like to focus more on in the future and Liz's input into this area will be invaluable. New groups. After a couple of very difficult years for all and the slow process of supporting groups to reopen post COVID, we have recently opened not one, but two new different stroke support groups. The first new group to open since October 2019 is DIS in South Norfolk. This group is run by volunteer Peter Ellis, who had a stroke at the age of 58, just after his retirement back in March of 2018. Peter had a hemorrhagic stroke and very nearly died, and he lives with severe disabilities as a result. Having had a long career in healthcare, Peter understands the benefits of sharing experiences and supporting people in similar situations. This led to Peter starting the DIS Peer Support Group. The group meets once a month and new members are welcome. If you are local to DIS, please get in touch with Peter on email through dis at differentstrokes.co.uk. The second new group is in Whitstable in Kent and is run by volunteer Jim Curry. Jim is no stranger to Different Strokes. He previously set up and ran our London South East group for over 10 years. While Jim experienced two strokes in 2006, at the age of 52, he has never let this hold him back. And he was one of the first stroke survivors to be selected onto the UK Stroke Forum Committee. Jim has completed many fundraising challenges, such as walking the Great Glen Way from Inverness to Fort William, running the New Forest Marathon and a motorcycle ride around the coast of Great Britain. The group meets at the Whitstable Umbrella Centre and they plan to hold meetings twice a month. To find out more about attending, you can contact Jim through email at whitstable at differentstrokes.co.uk. If you would like to find out more about Different Strokes support groups, please visit our website for more information. Okay. Get to know Ingrid Ash, who founded our Birmingham and Sandwell peer support group. This is Ingrid's words. I had a multifocal stroke in September 2007 when I was 31 weeks pregnant with my second daughter. My daughter was born seven weeks early by planned emergency caesarean. Without the support of family and a few close friends, I really don't know how we would have coped. I had my rehabilitation, a newborn baby, and our first daughter, who was two and a half. So I was completely overwhelmed. Our lives changed dramatically in an instant. We needed help. And one of the responses I had from a health professional was to contact Help the Aged. I was 27 and I really didn't think I would qualify for their help. My husband decided to take up the challenge to find help for us to come to terms with my stroke. And this was when we came across different strokes. There wasn't a local group at the time, so I made a promise to myself to set up a group to support others. In February 2010, we had the first meeting of the Birmingham Different Strokes group. As time went by, the group grew, offering friendship and support to those who wanted and needed it. We went from strength to strength with weekly inclusive exercise sessions and a fortnightly tea and chat group. 
We tried out lots of different activities, such as art sessions with a local artist, riding recumbent trikes, holding an annual quiz, and regular trips, including the local Christmas panto. When we closed due to COVID, we all kept in touch through WhatsApp chat, and I set up a private group on Facebook. Starting back up post COVID brought new challenges, such as needing to find a new venue and encouraging members to overcome fears about socialising face to face once again. We currently meet on the first Saturday of each month, but my aim is to return to weekly support and exercise for group members. I know how isolated you can feel after stroke, unable to do the same things you used to. It can be hard being a group coordinator while still managing my own personal recovery. However, this is outweighed by the appreciation from others and the mutual learning of coping strategies from fellow survivors in the group. Sometimes my youngest daughter feels guilty that she may have caused my stroke as I was pregnant with her at the time. I tell her that we shouldn't look at it that way and who knows why I had my stroke. I'm so grateful that no harm came to her and I remind her that without my stroke, we wouldn't have started the Different Strokes group and made all of the amazing friends we have done over the past 12 years. The group is very much a family affair where stroke survivors and their families are welcome. My youngest daughter has taken on the challenge of the Duke of Edinburgh Award and asked to volunteer within the group. Seizing that opportunity to get extra help, I asked her and her friend to design a leaflet to advertise the group, and I've encouraged them in honing their tea making skills. Ishmael, the son of one of our stroke survivors, has attended the group with his mother since he was four. Recently, he decided to set himself a challenge to walk five miles to raise funds for the group, and he raised over 700 pounds. Seeing him grow up, with an understanding and a want to help the group is a huge reward for me. 12 years of being a group coordinator. Wow, what an adventure that's been. Vision problems and stroke. Article by Dr. Lauren Hepworth, postdoctoral orthoptic research fellow. Our eyes and vision work together to allow us to see the world, look around at what we want and understand it. Each area of the brain contributes to this process, much of which happens without us even thinking about it. This is why vision problems after a stroke are so common. It is also possible that a vision problem is the only sign of a stroke. The types of vision problems can be split into three groups. Visual field loss, eye movement problems, and visual processing problems. It is possible for someone to have more than one vision problem after a stroke. Visual field loss is an area of vision that you cannot see. This could be in the middle of your vision, central, or off to the side, peripheral. Eye movement problems can include one or both eyes not moving together as a pair, or uncontrolled movement of the eyes, nystagmus. Visual processing problems are not related to a problem with seeing something, but rather to processing that information, such as recognising colours, familiar objects and people. It has been found that not all stroke survivors notice or can report symptoms of a vision problem. This is why it is important for all stroke survivors to have their vision checked. Identifying a problem allows treatment to be given, which may help with other areas of rehabilitation. It is possible that vision problems can improve after a stroke. 
However, the time frame and likelihood of this depends on the type of vision problem. And it is therefore important to ask an eye care professional about this. Depending on the type of vision problem, the treatment options will be different. It may be possible for one treatment option to be offered for the specific vision problem and others to be offered for specific difficulties, such as problems with reading. It is also important to consider vision problems that were there before the stroke, as new treatments may be needed. For example, it may not be possible to hold a magnifier, which was previously used easily. Care under an eye clinic, usually by an orthoptist, could also provide access to other services which you are entitled to. For example, a certificate of visual impairment registration. Eye clinics often have an eye clinic liaison officer or ECLO, who is a bridge between health and social services and is available for you to speak to. In my current research, I am investigating the impact of vision problems after stroke. We know that vision problems after stroke can have a big impact on quality of life, but it is possible with early identification and treatment to reduce this impact. One major impact is that it may not be possible to continue to drive with a vision problem after a stroke. The DVLA have set criteria about this and it is important to discuss this with an eye care professional. There is more information available from a range of sources. The British and Irish Orthoptic Society have a range of leaflets for the different types of vision problem which can occur after a stroke, including one specifically relating to driving and vision problems. You can find this on their website, www orthoptics.org.uk forward slash resources forward slash clinical hyphen advisory hyphen group forward slash stroke hyphen and hyphen neuro hyphen rehabilitation. The Vision Research Unit based at the University of Liverpool has developed a range of resources for stroke survivors and their families, as well as for healthcare professionals. You can find their website at vision-research.co.uk. PFO closures. In a previous newsletter, we featured a campaign to get funding for PFO closures reinstated by NHS England. This campaign was successful and many stroke survivors whose stroke had been caused by a PFO are now able to have a PFO closure operation providing they meet the eligible criteria. A PFO or Patton Feynman Oval, also known as a hole in the heart, is a hole between the two top chambers of the heart. It is present in around 25% of the population and for most people this causes no problem. But in some cases it can allow a blood clot to pass from the right side of the heart to the left and then into the brain causing a stroke. If you have a PFO and you have had a cryptogenic stroke where no other known cause for the stroke has been found, you may be at risk of a secondary stroke and this risk can be significantly decreased by closing the PFO. The operation itself involves implanting a PFO occluder, a small device placed in the heart to stop blood flow through the PFO. It takes around one to two hours and can be done by using an artery in the groin, preventing the need for open heart surgery. It is usually performed under general anaesthetic and patients will normally be discharged on the same day or the following day. While there is always a very small risk in any operation, 
In over 95% of cases, the procedure is a complete success with no significant complications. We asked our community of stroke survivors their advice for other people facing a PFO closure operation. Andy said, if you are facing this operation, my advice is don't worry about it. It's a straightforward procedure and the benefits are worth it. Claire says, my advice to others would be to understand that there are risks, but also that there are benefits. The op itself wasn't too bad. Ruth said, having a PFO closure was a positive experience for me and it has given me peace of mind. Alexandria says, my advice is to tell your consultant all of your worries. They know how to get you calm. Be honest about how you feel. Of course, it sounds daunting, but these guys do it all of the time. Lisa shared her experience with us in her own words. She says, initially, when I was told that I had a PFO, I was scared and worried that I could have another stroke. The stroke consultant at the time mentioned that it was very rare for this outcome and he had not seen many people in our local hospital with a PFO. So that made me worry even more. Leading up to the PFO operation, my husband and I were concerned about the pending operation and the side effects that could come with it. The operation took place in a London hospital, pre-COVID, a good 40 miles from my house. On the day of the operation, I was incredibly nervous. This obviously showed as the consultant calmed me down. The procedure itself was so quick. I went to the theatre and before I knew it, I was on the ward again. I received anaesthetic before, so I only remember the team talking to me in theatre after I woke up. They were telling me it was a success and that I should expect to be bruised for some time due to the clopidiodrol. When I woke, I could hear my wedding dance song playing on the radio, so I was a bit confused. Then I came to with a smile. The recovery itself was seamless. I had a month off of work as I was a healthcare assistant and it was advised not to walk a lot afterwards. The bruising stayed for a little while, as did the discomfort. For me, it was the fatigue that kicked in after the operation, which I was told is normal. I do not have any issues with the PFO now. I have been to the hospital several times to repeat the echo bubble test, to be informed that there are not any bubbles and that having the surgery has now reduced my risk of having another stroke. I would certainly say that it is worth having the operation and I need not have worried as much as I did. Here are some common side effects of the procedure. Tenderness or bruising at the wound site. Feeling palpitations or discomfort in the chest. This is common for around two to six weeks and treatment is not usually needed. You may also experience slight bleeding at the wound site. The advice on discharge is to take approximately a week off work although this may vary depending on the type of job that you do. They're advised to avoid heavy lifting for a week and avoid driving for at least 72 hours after the operation. Take a gradual approach to resuming exercise. And if you're unsure, please always check with your doctor or a medical professional. To read more about experiences of PFO closure, please visit differentstrokes.co.uk forward slash PFO hyphen closures. Amy's story. MP for East Dumbartonshire, Amy Callahan, spent four months in hospital and underwent two life-saving surgeries after collapsing at home in June 2020, aged just 28. Amy returned to the House of Commons for the first time in February 2021 and used this moment to fly the flag for stroke survivors, calling for more support and reform. Here's Amy's story in her own words. 
I was elected four months before my stroke. We were in the midst of the first lockdown and like many people, I was working from home. Life was less hectic than my usual routine of travelling to London weekly. On the day of my stroke, I developed a severe headache and lost feeling and movement in my left arm and leg. I knew something was seriously wrong and called an ambulance. I had suffered a brain hemorrhage and I was on a stroke ward for six weeks and in rehab for a further two and a half months. Recovery has been exhausting. I thought that fighting elections was hard, but this is the biggest and most draining challenge I hope I will ever face. I went through a period of intense grief and experienced all of the stages, full blown denial in rehab, and now acceptance, which has been the hardest part. It has brought with it a new perspective. We worry about a lot of things in life that we shouldn't worry about. It's taught me not to sweat the small things. It can be easy to paint recovery with a rosy perspective, but anyone affected by stroke will know that it can cause huge resentment, hurt and upset. Literally nothing positive can come from comparing myself constantly to how I was. That only roots my thoughts in loss. I knew I had to pick myself up and not wallow in those emotions for too long. The stroke hugely slowed down my life and affected my mobility. I live with fatigue, which is hard for others to understand. I try to explain it by likening my energy to a phone battery. A typical person wakes up fully charged at 100%, but I start the day with 60% and by lunchtime, my battery is depleted. Rehab will continue for the rest of my life and coming to that realization was a big moment. I think often people view stroke recovery as something that one day will just click into place, but that isn't how this works. This is an ongoing battle, but I will get there and it will be okay. I returned to work probably too quickly, working a bit in hospital and then virtually when I had been discharged. Life got better when I was working. It uplifts me to do a job that I love. I am helping people and they might not realise it, but they're helping me too. Work isn't going to be an option for everyone after a stroke. But don't let anyone tell you that it isn't for you, especially if you think it is and you feel ready. Having a sense of purpose, something to get up for and to keep you motivated can be really helpful. It has been more challenging since I physically returned to work in February. There will be challenges no matter where you work. I've had to fight for quite basic adjustments that I assumed would be in place and it makes me wonder how difficult it is out there in other workplaces. These issues are ongoing and I'm trying to address them. The more voices we have talking about the issues of working with a disability, the better. I'm the vice chair of the all party parliamentary group for stroke, a forum for MPs and peers across all parties to come together to work on stroke issues. We meet six times a year alongside stroke organisations and charities and work to progress the agenda and move things forward for stroke survivors. Whilst I am an MP at Westminster, I want to use my voice and the platform that I have to stand up for stroke survivors, particularly those who are younger, as too many of us are often overlooked. I will continue to call on the government to do more to support disabled people with improvements to the welfare system. People are not being provided with enough support for living costs, let alone the costs of recovery. Increasing benefits for stroke survivors will allow people to invest in proper rehab, 
and allow them to recover without money concerns hanging over them. Without this support, we will have a larger disabled population who are unable to work and the actual cost of this will be far greater down the line. In order to get back to Westminster, I had to be able to stand for long enough to give my returning speech to Parliament. I worked so hard in rehab with the team at Stratford Clyde University to make this happen. I have been part of a research study there which helped me set and achieve this goal. When I returned, my first speech was for my constituent and now friend Stacy, a fellow stroke survivor who was having welfare issues and wasn't being properly supported. After a video of that speech went online, I received an outpouring of messages from fellow survivors. I didn't anticipate this and it was unbelievable and touching. There is something that unites us, brings us together. We just get each other. I hadn't experienced that before and it was pretty special. I'm working towards goals all the time. Every week I arrive at Euston and I challenge myself to walk along the platform without my crutch. The surfaces vary so much, so it really challenges me. And my tip to fellow stroke survivors is learn to laugh at yourself. Try not to take what you're going through seriously all of the time. It will be brutal and rough as it is. Our favourite song in the gym was I'm Still Standing by Elton John. I sang that song at the top of my lungs when I couldn't stand at all and I found it hilarious. I needed that dark sense of humour because if I didn't laugh, I would cry. Try and find some lightheartedness within yourself and most importantly, keep going. Don't give up. If you have been inspired by Amy's story and would like to share your own, please email us on info at differentstrokes.co.uk to find out more. And you can read more survivor stories at our website, www.differentstrokes.co.uk. Explaining stroke to people who don't understand. Before your stroke, you likely had little understanding of what it actually meant. As with most challenges in life, you can't fully understand it unless you experience it. After a stroke, it quickly becomes clear that there is a lack of awareness and many misconceptions around strokes and their impact. The effects vary so much from person to person and from day to day and that can make it hard to understand yourself, let alone to explain to others. What you share or don't share is entirely up to you. There seems little benefit in going into something traumatic with a stranger in passing, but it may be useful to indicate that you need extra support. With family, friends and colleagues, it can be crucial to set boundaries advocate for yourself and ask for help. It can be exhausting having to be a teacher whilst you're still learning yourself, but in our experience, it can be helpful to do this in the long run. For everyday social situations where you don't really want to explain, the Hidden Disabilities Sunflower is a globally recognised symbol for non-visible disabilities. You can purchase a lanyard online as a way to tell the outside world that you need support without needing to share the intricate details. You can complete the card that comes with the lanyard, which helps others to understand your needs. You can visit the Hidden Disabilities store to find out more. To help family and friends understand. How your family and friends respond to your stroke will vary. Some may be supportive and want to understand as much as they can. Others may make assumptions or seem not interested. We provide information packs free of charge 
which have a wealth of information on life after stroke. The pack comes in sections, and in particular, the section on invisible disabilities may be useful for your loved ones to read. We also have a range of books and leaflets for the children of stroke survivors that can help start an age appropriate conversation about your stroke. One of our members has even created her own books for her children, inspired by our resources, which go into more detail about her specific needs. You can use our resources or create your own. To help employers and colleagues understand. If you have returned to work, hopefully you have had discussions around the impact of your stroke and the reasonable adjustments that you may need already, but there is more that you can do. We have a work after stroke guidance for employers guide. You can download it from our website in our information pack section, and we can also post this booklet out to you or your employer on request. Be open with trusted colleagues. If you have colleagues you work closely with, it may be useful to be open about the impact of your stroke and how it affects you. Some of our community have even been invited to hold presentations about their experience to their colleagues. Opening up takes a lot of courage and it is important that if you do, that you feel supported to do so and safe. If you would like any of our resources or would like to discuss anything in this article, give us a call on 0345 130 7172 to find out more. Our BAS project. In 2021, we commenced our BAS or Black and Asian Stroke Survivors project. Black and South Asian people are at much greater risk of stroke, with studies indicating that black people are twice as likely to have a stroke as white people, and that black and South Asian people have strokes at a younger age. However, this diversity has not been entirely reflected amongst the community of stroke survivors that different strokes supports. While around 10% of the UK population is of Black or South Asian descent, in 2021, only around 4% of our beneficiaries were from these communities. With such statistics, we felt that it was no longer enough to simply state that our services were open and available to all communities, but that we had to proactively look at the reasons why this was the case and take action to change this. We set up a focus group of Black and Asian stroke survivors who helped us to identify four main barriers. First was lack of information. For example, leaflets about stroke not containing specific information for people from Black or Asian communities or not being accessible for people whose first language is not English. Second was lack of awareness. People from Black and Asian communities not being aware of the risk of stroke at all ages, and in particular, not being aware of the increased risk of stroke that they may face. Third was a lack of representation, a lack of images of Black and Asian people, meaning that stroke survivors who were looking at, for example, our website, would not necessarily have seen themselves in the images and the stories shared. Fourth was cultural or social barriers. Some communities are very strongly shaped by religion or culture, and this can include stigma around disabilities and a reluctance to look for support outside of their communities. Thanks to the initial work we did in this area, our 2022 survey showed that our beneficiaries from Black and Asian communities had increased to around 6%. However, we still have a long way to go, and we feel that in order to make further progress, we need to have a dedicated member of staff to focus solely on this issue. Thanks to some external funding, including from the National Lottery Awards for All, 
we are delighted to have recruited Rahal Karavilla on an initial 12 month part time contract to take this work forward. Rahal was 22 when she had a hemorrhagic stroke caused by an AVM rupture in 2016. After waking up from a coma, she found she could not move the left side of her body. She also experienced short term memory loss. Over the past six years, her memory has improved and she has regained some motor control in her left side. Previously, Rahal worked in urban planning and development. She moved to the UK in 2020 and prior to joining Different Strokes, she worked with a startup that helped disabled people find accessible places in London. Rahal says, after benefiting from the support services Different Strokes provided over lockdown, I'm grateful to be part of the team and to raise awareness of stroke amongst Black and Asian communities whilst providing support to survivors who have faced similar adversity in their recovery after stroke. It's been fantastic to meet many people during my first few weeks in the role, and I was particularly pleased to be able to take part in the annual Absale event. If you would like more information, do contact us info at differentstrokes.co.uk. Could I Have Post-Stroke Spasticity by Mrs. Carolyn Belford, Clinical Specialist, Physiotherapist at the Hayward Hospital, Stoke-on-Trent. What is spasticity? Spasticity may be experienced by people who have had damage caused to the brain, such as a stroke. Up to 42.6% of stroke survivors will develop spasticity within six months after their first stroke, but spasticity might develop even later. Spasticity symptoms are varied, but people often report muscles feel stiff, heavy, abnormally tight and difficult to move. When the muscle is stretched, there is more resistance to movement than normal. Some people develop spasms, jerking or shaking of the legs. Muscle tightness may be constant or increased during activity. How can you recognise problematic spasticity? The ACTIONS acronym can help you assess if your spasticity symptoms require management. A stands for activities limited. Are activities which you were able to do previously more difficult due to muscle tightness and stiffness of your limbs? Have you got difficulty walking due to muscle stiffness? Do your limbs feel heavy? Do you have difficulty balancing because of jumping of the foot, catching of the toes or the foot turning in due to overactive muscles? C stands for care task difficult. Does muscle stiffness limit your ability to carry out your personal care tasks? Muscle stiffness or spasms that are causing difficulty with everyday tasks such as washing and dressing cleaning your hands or cutting your nails due to the clenching of the fingers, washing under your arms or placing your arm into a sleeve. T is for tight muscles. Is it difficult to position your joints where your splints, a device used to stretch and lengthen muscles and stretch? Spasticity can cause muscle stiffness and contracture which is when the muscles, ligaments and soft tissues around the joints shorten and become stiff, preventing movement and causing abnormal posture and pain. I is for integrity of skin. Do you have pressure sores or broken skin? Problems with pressure sores or poor skin condition caused by poor posture that increases the pressure on bone areas of the body. O is for ongoing pain. Do you have pain in your muscles or joints because of muscle spasms, clenching of the fingers or toes or poor posture? Spasticity can be painful because of tight, stiff muscles, spasms or cramps, 
abnormal joint position, or because of poor posture. Poor posture can cause joint and spinal pain. N is for nails digging in. Is the clenching of the fingers causing your nails to dig into the palm of your hand? Muscle spasms or tight muscles can cause the nails to dig into the palm or reduced air circulation to your palm, causing poor hand hygiene and a risk of broken skin. S is for sleep. Have you experienced disturbed sleep? Being woken at night due to these muscle spasms, stiffness or repetitive tapping of the feet that causes fatigue. Does your spasticity require treatment? If you think you may have spasticity, speak to your GP. They will be able to refer you and tell you whether you need to go to a rehabilitation specialist. Spasticity is not always harmful and can even help with movement, such as supporting the legs in walking. However, it can change over time and become a problem due to different factors. Changes in lifestyle, such as reduced exercise or movement. Infections, for example, a urinary tract infection or viral illness. Pain, for example, from arthritic joints. Constipation or bladder issues. Poor posture in sitting or lying. Red or broken skin and pressure damage to the skin emotional stress. Spasticity management may include physical therapy, splints, stretching exercises, occupational therapy, as well as medicines to help the muscles to relax. This double page was commissioned by Ipsen. The content has been jointly developed with Mrs. Carolyn Belford, who received an honorarium from Ipsum Limited for providing this service. Fundraising news. Hear about some of the fantastic and innovative ways our beneficiaries and supporters have been raising funds for us. Meet Jill Hembury. Jill says, I didn't know much about strokes until I had one myself in January. It was such a shock. I found out about different strokes through the Stroke Association and the Facebook group has probably saved my sanity. There is always someone to offer support or advice day or night and the daily exercises gave me the reminder I needed every day. I usually do a charity plant sale every summer but I didn't think I would be able to manage it this year but then a friend on the Facebook group signed up to do the abseil for different strokes and it convinced me to try. The plants are all donated by the wonderful Chris and Jason from Tickenham Garden Park. I organised a convoy of friends and neighbours for the trip. They looked like part of a parade, crammed with flowers. I've been selling outside my house and met the most kind, amazing and generous people. I have no facial recognition, which has caused a few laughs. I've had lots of help getting my stall through my terraced house twice a day, particularly from my son and grandson. The sale has helped with my confidence, stamina and speech, and I can't wait to do it all again next year. Brave Abseilers raise over £11,000. Our annual Abseil took place on the 11th of September at the Arcelior Mitel Orbit at Stratford Park. The Abseil is an event that is open to all abilities, so it is a particularly inviting challenge to stroke survivors who would otherwise normally be excluded from taking part. We talked to some of the participants about why they chose to take on this terrifying freefall Abseil. Meet Kay Moores, she says, I hear the same phrase every day from strangers when they ask what happened to me. But you are so young. Since having had strokes and joining different strokes, you realise that 37 wasn't young at all. 
strokes can affect people's lives at any point. I may have been left with vertigo when I'm fatigued, but I decided to do the abseil to raise both money and awareness for the charity. Having a brain injury is a scary, lonely event and having people to talk to that understand your daily challenges and provide advice or just a listening ear can make an awful situation a little more bearable. Yes, I'm apprehensive about doing the abseil with one hand and whilst it might be scary, nothing can be as frightening as having a stroke. I'm two years post-stroke and there's 100% life after stroke and I plan to live mine to the fullest. Meet Claire Mabbitt. She says, eight years ago at the age of 35, I had a stroke. Different strokes helped me to come to terms with my new world. They gave me a sense of solidarity. Although the physical effects of my stroke only lasted a couple of years, I feel like my confidence still needs a boost. And what better way than by proving to myself that I can face my fear of heights. If I can do an abseil at 114 metres, then what can't I do? Meet Ruth Davis. She says, four years ago, my husband Carl had two strokes which changed our lives forever. He was 39 years old. Since then, he has had to stop working and driving, both of which he loved. Different Strokes has been the most amazing support for all of us. Carl has done some fundraising before, but this is my opportunity to do something as well. Our fantastic team of 20 abseilers raised around 11 and a half thousand pounds. A huge thank you to everyone who took part, donated or supported the abseilers on the day. Polo Fundraiser raises over £10,000. Meet Lewis Kuma. He says, I suffered two simultaneous strokes a year ago, aged 33, on my way back from work on the train. I was at University College London Hospital for a week and then taken to my local hospital to convalesce for two more weeks. As it was during COVID, I was in quarantine for most of my time there and it was the loneliest time of my life. I still remember looking up and counting the tiles of the ceiling, 532 to be precise. I then went to Danesbury Neurological Centre, still in a wheelchair. I was told to manage my expectations about leaving there walking. That was like waving a red rag to a bull. I had to leave there walking. I practiced every spare minute that my severe fatigue would allow. Wiggling my big toe turned into walking with a stick. One meter turned into two and so on. Six weeks later, I left there walking the 10 feet to my car. It was the hardest 10 feet I've traveled in my life. Blood, sweat and tears got me there. I'm still recovering and I still suffer every symptom of a stroke survivor to this day in one way or another. My wife Charlotte has been amazing, caring for me, our baby girl born just four months after it happened and our two-year-old. I'm very determined to get back to my city job, but in the meantime, I thought I would do something productive during my recovery. I organised a charity dog show at Silver Lays Polo Club in Little Haddam on the 14th of August 2022 to raise funds for different strokes. Unfortunately, because of the extreme heat, I had to cancel the dog show, but I still attended the event with Adam Femi, who is a specialist dog trainer and appeared in Crufts. He gave up his time to support me and we still had a great day raising funds for different strokes. My personal fundraising page is standing at over £10,000. Please contact us, info at differentstrokes.co.uk if you've been inspired by Lewis or any of our fundraisers.
wear your different strokes merchandise with pride. Check out our online shop, which has just been stocked with Christmas cards and gifts and much, much more. www.differentstrokeshop.co.uk Every purchase makes a difference. We're a small charity trying to achieve big things. Thank you so much for reading or listening to this edition of our newsletter, which would not have been possible without our fantastic advertisers. We're going to share a little bit more about them in the next few minutes. Physiofunction offer hands-on therapy, technology and exercise in clinic or at home with tele-rehab. Their stroke rehabilitation programmes are always tailored exactly to your needs. They have clinics in the Midlands and their services vary by location. Give them a call on 0800 043 0327 or check out their website www.physiofunction.co.uk. 0% discount, 100% the best prices. Compare prices from a wide range of travel insurance specialists in no time at all. Whether you've already booked your holiday or you're still dreaming about that well-earned getaway, head over to medicaltravelcompared.co.uk and start comparing. No messy paperwork, no constant phone calls and no stress. Medical Travel Compared. .co.uk. The Exopulse Molly Suit by Ottobock, the world's first electrically powered neuromodulation suit for improved mobility, balance, blood circulation, and pain relief. The Exopulse Molly Suit allows its users to enjoy a more active and less painful daily life by reducing spasticity, weak muscle activation, and chronic pain relief. To inquire, please call 01784 744 900 or email bockuk at ottobock.com. That's B O C K U K at ottobock.com. Please quote the reference DS 0322. Make the most out of life to become or stay active while living with the effects of a stroke. Oddstock Medical Limited is the leading provider of FES treatment and equipment to the NHS. There are many elements which can help to achieve this, from physiotherapy to exercise, including functional electrical stimulation or FES. FES is a rehabilitation technique to support and improve function for neurological conditions. FES activates weak muscles by stimulating the nerves with small electrical impulses. It can improve walking, for example, with drop foot and provide rehabilitation to strengthen weak muscles and reduce pain in upper limbs, which in turn can lead to general increased freedom and independence. Live your fulfilled life from popping to the shops to climbing a mountain. We believe everyone deserves to live their best life. Contact your local healthcare professional for advice on the right combination for you. If they are unaware of FES and would like to know more, please ask them to contact Oddstock Medical Limited on 017-224-39540 or email inquiries at oddstockmedical.com. <laughs> 